What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This is Muscle, and this is another Two Line Music Cuts Entertainment Report podcast. And today, we have a lyrical maverick in the building today. Listen, this lady's been giving you hits from in the early 90s until right now. She gave you songs like, you know, Ready for This, Goggle, and so much more. You know we have in the building today? We have Tanya Stevens in the building today. What's going on, my sister? I am here, and I'm happy to be here. Big of yourself. Thank you for having me. All right. Here on the Entertainment Report podcast, we like to go right from the beginning and then bring us right up to 2022. So my first question for you is this. Where do you grow up in Jamaica, and what type of child were you? Well, I grew up in St. Mary, in a little town called Richmond. And what type of child was I? Um, the, the description of my childhood will vary depending on who you listen to. So if I tell you, then I would say I'm a really good child and I'm smart. I, I was smart. I really loved books. I loved learning and I loved experimenting and exploring. Um, if you listen to my teachers, uh, you might hear that I talk too much. If you listen to my mother, she might say I was a troublemaker. But I will work with my own definition as a really good kid was smart i love to explore definitely and th you know what i'm going to take your definition with a bit of what your mom would think and a bit of what your teachers would think and put it together that that's <laughs> my opinion <laughs> that works <laughs> all right and so then now growing up what did you want to be what did you think you were going to be growing up well first i just couldn't wait to be adult um, that, see, that didn't work out so well, <laughs> um, but I, I had so many things I wanted to be when I was really, really young, you know, um, I was convinced by the people around me that because I talked so much, I should study law. And that is such a grave misconception of law <laughs> that, that it's about talking too much. It's not, it really isn't. It's about critical thinking which I do believe I have that mm -hmm. capacity, but I do um, first to writing, um, you know, I found my home mm -hmm. music for me was, it was more than, more than an ambition, more than a job to aspire to because it was expression of self. For creativity so that music really hit the spot and held me permanently it was music okay what do you remember the first time you heard music or an artist or a sound or something that made that caught your attention where you said you know what i like this here this connects with me i can't tell there's no specific point um when you grew up in jamaica i i want to think that this applies to the rest of the caribbean too but Growing up in Jamaica, music is a big part of everybody's life. You know, we use music to express. We use music to connect. We use music for, for everything. If you're happy, it's music. If you're sad, it's music. If you're angry, it's music. It, it's for everything. And, and so there was no one point where I connected with the music or where any one thing happened and drew me in. It was everything. It was always there. You know, there's always a song to say exactly what you want to say to your mother that you can't say because you would get a beating. Mm -hmm. um, music has all of that. And so it was from day one, you know, listening to everything and everybody being a part of my life, being inspired by people like Barris Hammond, um, Lord Kitchener, Sparrow. Um, and, and I want to, I want to make a point of that too, because we tend to think of music in a box. And it is not. Music influences everything. So music was a big part of my school life because it was through the, the writings of people like Sparrow and, and Kitchener, the, 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 the tongue-in-cheek, the twist on the words, and, and you know, the, 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 mostly the cheek um, that captivated me. And I threw that into my literature and language career in school, and I excelled. These guys helped me to think and they sharpened my wits. And, and along with 
along with um, literature, with, with popular literature, novels. These are the things which actually honed and, and, and brought my skills to the fore. So, yeah, music is a, yeah, man, it was always there. What did you discover first? Your voice or your ability to actually write something? Writing first. Yeah. Um, I grew up with my, I, I spent a lot of time with my eldest sibling. My eldest sibling, my big sister, was a literature teacher. Uh, was because she's no longer with us, but her teachings can never, can never depart from me. She was the one who first made me read as a, as a toddler. She taught me to read, to spell my name. Um, books were a really big part of my, my whole life, our life. Um, in our house, it wasn't, it wasn't centered around a TV. It was centered around books. Um, we didn't have very much. We didn't have much of anything, but we had books, hand-me-down books, um, gifted books, comics. Um, Archie comic was a big part of my life. Enid Blyton was a huge part of my life. The faraway tree, the enchanted forest, Nadi, the three gully ones, all of the Enid Blyton series. And it was through literature that I actually came into music because first I wrote poems, then I turned them into songs. I wrote short stories, I wrote long stories, and then I came into music. So writing for me, when other people focus on the melody and the singing and the vocal range, I care almost exclusively about the writing. Which is the writing, which is the storytelling, which is the how you could bring it out of your mind to the masses. Yes, that's exactly it. Definitely. So when did you actually discover your voice now and actually put the two of them together? I don't know if I've even discovered my voice yet. <laughs> I'm, I, I sing by default because for me, the perfect scenario would be me writing for other people, but I didn't know anybody. I'm from the country. I'm from the bush. I didn't know anybody who sang or I was never exposed to anybody who sang who would even listen to me and sing what I said. So singing for me, my voice was discovered quite by, oh, it, it was kind of like a means to an end um, because I needed my, my, I wanted to hear my song song. And, and when, I, when I sang them to people and they said, oh, you can't sing, I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about, but if you say so. <laughs> That was so that was how you so it was basically by accident you basically discovered your voice. And was it singing, DJing, or sing Jing first for you? It was everything. It was anything. I'm I'm into I'm really into the enunciation. I'm into the emotions of delivery. Um I I love getting a point across. So it doesn't matter if it's debating or if it's reading a poem or if it's singing or if it's DJing. It's anything. Sometimes when I'm making songs, or when I'm making an album and I have the room to be more creative because, you know, with a song, it's just three minutes, it's four minutes, and you have to get the entire thing into the song. But with an album, it's kind of like you get to transform that into an entire movie. And I can put on, um, I can put an intro, which is not a song. I can put skits. I can do anything I want. Mm. And, and so I've done singing preaching or talking every form of expression and i can't choose either i like them all because they serve their own purposes so i came into the business just doing whatever my mind felt was was appropriate for the time the the the, 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 the occasion and what were your first movements towards actually now you discovered this is, I could write, okay, I have a voice or people say I have a voice. What was your first move to actually start to get into the business, especially coming from a place like St. Mary where there's no real recording studios or anything. What was your first move? Well, I heard, I used to, I used to visit my, my eldest sister in Ocherius at St. Anne and she was teaching at the high school, she was teaching at Audrey Secondary School. And I would stay with her sometimes. And 
on my way there, I had to pass by what, what later became IRFM. Um, it was Grove Entertainment. And I heard that there was a studio there. I heard there was a recording studio there. And, and so one day on my way from school, when I was going to St. Mary High, I was in my green uniform with my white blouse, green tunic, white underblouse. And I stopped by, and this was in my grade 11 year. I was in fifth form. And it was almost summertime. So I was just doing six scenes and about to go off, like <laughs> into adulthood. I was 15 and I'm, I was turning 16 on the 2nd of July. And in June, I stopped by the studio. Um, and there was a gentleman sitting outside. He was just sitting there. And I said, good afternoon. And he said, good afternoon. Can I help you? And I said, well, I hope so. I hear there's a recording studio here. And he said, yeah, I, I, I'll, and what do you want with a recording studio? And I was like, well, I want to sing. I write songs and I want to come sing them. And he was like, you write song and you want to come sing. Go back to school. <laughs> Go to school. I, I, I move. <laughs> and he chased me. I was so unceremonious and I was angry. I was so annoyed. I was like, you got a brother and I'm no manners. He became my best friend. <laughs> That was Barry O'Hare. He was the first person in music ever I had any interaction with. He was the first one. He, he sent me back to school. And he said, when you come back when you finish school. So I came back in the summertime. And he was like, what do you want? And I said, you told me to come back when I finished school. And he said, I didn't mean when you get holidays. I mean, when you're finished with school. And I'm like, I'm finished with school, sir. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I just graduated. And he said, oh, yeah, it's the way you can do. I say, I write songs and I want to sing them. And he said, let me hear what you can do. Mm -hmm. And I sang something for him. And then he said, oh, it's have a thing. It's have a thing. And I said, what that mean? And I thought, well, I guess he means that there's something about me that, you know, yeah, I'm in. Later on, when we became good friends, I realized that he would say that whenever he thought it was trash, but he didn't want to hurt your feelings. I'm like, Jesus, you said that to me, you wretch. You wretch. <laughs> yeah, but that was my first. Barry O'Hare was a portal through which I entered this industry. Yeah. Because I know that you guys actually worked on an album together, which was on um, Big Things I've Won. Oh, that launched me. That was my introduction to music completely. I became an artist. And people took me seriously. I became a contender. You know, I was in the game. And that was, that was it. My, my, well, Barry is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. We lost him in... 2020, and I'm still not processing that um, well, but that was my introduction. And he's always, he's always been there, you know? He's the, the most common thread in my career and then my life because we developed such a, it, it was really a, a a very close friendship. We we fought. We we made up. There was no we we there. There's nothing that could challenge us. You know, at the end of it all, we got to the point where we were just so comfortable. Like I could I could say anything to him, do anything. He could say anything to me, and we knew that we were safe space for each other. You know, so every every time I went out, if I had my heart broken, I could come back and cry on his shoulder. You know, if. It was some bad happening in business. I could come back and cry. And he would come to me. The last thing we did, we were comparing separation. He went through a divorce. I was about to go through a divorce. And we were comparing notes. And we had a competition. He won. <laughs> <laughs> he won. Hands down. I was, I was like, yo, yo, you win. You win. You win. You win. You take okay. this. You take, take it all. Take this. <laughs> <laughs> so at this but time we learned to laugh at everything. We laugh, we laugh at ourselves, we laugh at each other, 
And, you know, it makes life easier to digest when you, you apply some humor to it. And you realize it's not that serious. It's just like, are you going to get up tomorrow? Are you going to leave? And that was us. Barry was my portal and Barry became my rock and he was my shoulder. And I hope I was all those things for him too. Definitely. So when this album came out here, you still didn't get to Kingston yet. You're still just recording over in Ochi by Grove Studio. So when do you get to Kingston? Did the music take you to Kingston or you just ventured out there at that time there? Well, actually, I kind of thought I went to Kingston a little bit in between um, making that album for Barry. I used to be, I was so hungry for it. I wanted it, you know, and I was impatient and I was like, you're not moving fast enough. You're not doing anything. What are we doing? You don't seem to be doing anything. And he was like, you know what? I can't wait till you get to Kingston. And they chew you up and spit you out. <laughs> <laughs> so I ran off to Kingston. I went to Kingston. And I, I when I came back, I was crying like, Barry, you remember what you said? <laughs> 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 like you were right you were right yeah but yeah then kingston kingston came properly after we did that album and they every, people started taking it seriously you know like yo this girl could write and and, and then i heard him saying she could sing too so i was like hey if you say it so i'm gonna do it <laughs> i'm not i'm not arguing when you got to Kingston, who did you connect with first? Did you connect with Exterminator first or with Dave Kelly? Actually, the first place I went to Kingston was New Name Music, belonging to a guy named Castro Brown, mm. based out of the UK. Um, that was at, nothing happened from New Name Music, but that was the first place physically that I went into. And then I, I got introduced after that to exterminator the fattest and i did record for exterminator a bit and then i was also i did the the one song with dave kelly which was you know ready for this on joyride which was that was that was like an explosion nothing could prepare me for that that was okay, so phenomenal take your time with this one here because i want to know how you even got to dave kelly how you got that explosion and why it was only one song that you recorded for dave kelly well i got introduced to dave because i was hanging out with um with a guy who used to produce at the time he was um he was working with garnet silk they were collins out of mandible and uh, we met at grove we met he was a friend of barry's and we met at Barry Studio. So then I was, I started, you know, working out with him. Um, we did we, we, we would just hang out and, and make full around music. And he told me that Dave had already me was working on and he wanted me to come put something on it. And I was like, Dave as in the Dave Kelly? What? <laughs> oh yeah. And I went and I heard, when I heard Joyride with him, first of all, there were so many misconceptions that I had based on the things people said, you know, mm -hmm. because people, when people talked about me, they used to say he hugs all the praise and the credits and he doesn't let anybody write and he doesn't this and he doesn't that. And I was like, well, how is this going to work? When I go by Dave, I like to write for myself because I have so much to say, you know, and I want to say my things. But when I went to Dave, I was like, you know what? Let me not be choosy because he puts out so many hits and he's making good music and, at the end of the day, I want to make music. So let me just go. And I went and I was prepared for him to write something for me. But then he said, I want you to write. And I was like, what? what do you mean? I said, I want you to write something. And I was like, D that threw me for a loop because everybody kept saying he never let anybody write. So I was like, okay, then maybe you really shouldn't listen to what anybody says. And then... I was listening to the beat and I, and, and I couldn't come up with something. And he gave me the rhythm to take home and he said, listen to it overnight. And I was like, what? Because people told me that he never let anybody out of the studio with a beat. Mm -hmm. So these were two things which were already incorrect by the time I met him. And then I listened to it. I couldn't come up with anything. So I came back and I was like, yo, I can't. I, 
the beat felt odd to me. Um, I couldn't, it felt like it was between two keys, like there were two different keys and I couldn't figure out. It felt like it was off key. And then it was also off beat. So I couldn't, I couldn't snap, I couldn't figure out. So I came back to him and I was like, but I don't want you to miss me. I want to be on it. I want to be on it. So I came back and I was like, yo, I can't come up with anything. You write something for me. And he said, but I want, I want what you have to say. I want what you have to say. All right. If you could write on it, what would you have said? What would you talk about? And I said, well, I would probably want to talk about men and how braggadocio men are. Um, how men always boast that they have such high libido and they're so good and they last all night. But when I meet them, when I personally meet them, that's not been my experience. And it was like, oh, you mean like, so you don't want to say, the man, them are ready for this thing. And I'm like, definitely not ready for this. <laughs> and it's like, all right, that's the hook. You're not ready for this yet, boy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I love this song already. I love this song. And he, when, when we did that, and I was just, I think I was in St. Mary. One night, me and my sister, my big sister was driving near Port Maria and we're listening to the radio and then we hear the song, come on. And I was like, that's me, that's me. <laughs> oh my God. And then I heard it and heard it and heard it and heard it. I heard it and it was so much. I was like, all right, can we stop? No, it, I'm tired of this song. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't complain. I'm grateful. I will forever be grateful. That was one of the best introductions any artist could ever hope to have into the music industry. And there will be, there will never be anything in my career that can possibly equal that. You know, because that was, that's like my maiden voyage into popularity and big up Barry, because if without Barry, there would be no Dave Kelly, you know, he introduced me and the rest was just like smooth sailing, really. How come you only recorded one song for Dave Kelly? I mean, we talked about doing stuff after that. Um, but then Dave was an, well, he, Dave is a very exclusive kind of person, you know, and I was an explorer. So I wanted to be all over the place. Bobby Digital had a different sound and I wanted to be there. And, and Shocking Vibes had a different sound and I wanted to be there. I worked with Tony Kelly's brother. I worked with um, Bobby Digital. I worked with Shocking Vibes. I, worked, I, I, I was just all over the place and, I, and that really didn't, didn't fit into Dave's plan, but, you know, we, we, we just didn't make any more music at the time. And then later, when I was more established, I, reached, I found him, I reached out to him, and I was like, yo, let's do some work. And we talked about doing some work, and he was game. And, and that, somehow, we just never, we never got around to it. I still, I still hold that dream of one day, the two of us sitting down and making a full body of work, because... The way he thinks about music, the way he approaches music, he's very intimate with his music. He is a nerd. He's a, a very immersed nerd when it comes to his music. And that is who I think I am. And I feel like we're compatible that way. So I still want to make something. But when I, every time I run into him, like, well, I've run into him, I, let me see, on Jamra Cruise. I was just walking down a hallway and saw him and Janet walking. And I was like, Dave Amit Ball, I cried because I hadn't seen him in so many years. And I was just like, oh my God, me happy to see you, me love you, me miss you. And it was so emotional for me seeing him. Um, I am I'm a very emotional person. I'm passionate about everything in my life. You know, and the people I hold dear, I really I squeeze them. And even if I don't physically see them, even if I don't touch them with my hands, even if they can't feel me with, you know. The, the five senses that we were accustomed to, the, the, every other sense has them <laughs> in high esteem and in my arms and in my heart. So when I saw him, it was like, I don't know, it's a relief seeing him and being able, no, these days I'm very happy when I'm able to see somebody there and say, hey, I love you and I appreciate you. 
it makes me happy being able to say that because these are things we usually keep inside. And then when somebody, one of us passes and it goes with us and it's never said, and I don't want to carry anything. I'm going home free and, you know, I want nothing to take. So it was great seeing him, but there's, there's no, there's been so many stories I have heard and all the stories come from outside of the two of us, you know, and it's, it's great when we're adults and we can just be like, yeah, whatever. And talk to each other because we we'll tell you, I would love to sit and do some kind of a body of work with Dave because I think mature Dave and mature Tanya, I don't think the world can handle. They're not ready for this. Still not ready for this. They're still they're still not ready for this in a 22, no. 2022 setting. You understand? <laughs> yeah, I think we'll do it though. A name you just brought up too, Shocking Vibe. Were you ever an official member of Shocking Vibes crew or you just did a lot of work over there? Um, unofficial member of Shocking Vibes. I claim Shocking Vibes as my family. Um, it felt nice because I belonged somewhere. When I was pregnant with my daughter, I was recording with Shock Shocking Vibes. And everybody in Shocking Vibes felt like an uncle. You know, everybody, they looked out for me. Patrick, oh God, I was in Patrick's lap sitting down, bawling in his ears, complaining about everything which had nothing to do with the music, nothing to do with any of his business. I turned him into a mentor. I don't know if he wanted to meet. I didn't care. Um, I was well looked, up, looked after when I was there. I was never hungry. Everybody fussed over me. I made sure I ate because I had a baby inside of my belly. And then when I gave birth to my child, hmm. God, we bring the, my daughter to the studio. She slept on a bench in penthouse studio on, on blankets while I went in the voice room and everybody babysat. She was sitting in Patrick's lap in, in front of the mixing board while I was in the voice room. And Beanie Man was babysitting. Tanta was babysitting. Devante was babysitting. And it was, it felt nice. It was family. Big up Silver Cat. Everybody was family, you know? And the engineers, Delhi Ranks, everybody. Who used to be at Pentos and who was a part of Shocky Vibes crew, you know, Dean Mundy. Um, if, I, I can't understand, I can't remember everybody's name at once, but the entire family was my family. And I was a family member. We went on the road together, we did shows together. Um, it was a very happy time. It was. Mm -hmm. I understand because I know one of your, I'm not sure if this was one of your earlier, but I know one of your hits, massive hits that you got from Shocking Vibes was Goggle. How do you even come up with yeah. this now? We know them are ready for this. Now Goggle, like, okay, what are you pushing here, Tanya? How did you come up with this one here? Well, first of all, let me tell you the irony of this. Mm -hmm. You're not ready for this yet? Which launched me, I was the biggest song to date and still one of the biggest songs now. Um, mm -hmm. Was Tony, was Dave Kelly, Goggle was Tony Kelly at Shocking for Shocking Vibes. Yeah. 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 So um, it, it, we're never too far from each other, are we? Um, it's, it's family settings, always. And I did more work with Tony after that too. And mm -hmm. that gang was one of the biggest. When they, they put that um, on a white label um, on the Buster Rhymes, that Buster Rhymes beat, and that is still a big jam to this day. When I, I mean, I go in the clubs and they throw that on in the, in the, in the hip hop segment and it's, it's still wild to see that. And I, I'm, I'm all struck by all these things, you know, because you have to understand I'm a little girl from Richmond, St. Mary, I come from the bush and I'm somewhere halfway across the world and somebody throws on my old record and, and the place lift up. And I have to pinch myself very often mm -hmm. just to, just to be sure if, if it's really me, you know, am I here? Am I doing this? Is it a dream? I, and I'm still not sure. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy because another one that you did with, um, shocking vibes again, that got good traction was, um, big, heavy gal. This is where you're now showing another side. You know what I mean? How did you come up with that one here now for Shock and Vibes? And this is on the cost-cost rhythm here now. Well, first of all, 
When I did Big Heavy Girl, I weighed 96 pounds. <laughs> 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 so talk about everything. Um, I was tiny. I was very tiny physically. Um, but in my head, I was always a giant. I'm a giant. I measure up. I measure up both. Um, I'm not a compromising person, you know, when it comes to stature, my stature. I don't care about the measures of other people. I really don't. I don't measure myself against other people. I measure myself against the established um, norms. And I come out heads and shoulders above everything that I see around me. I, I don't accept. I don't accept anything. I, I don't think I have to. And so Big Heavy Girl is just expression of that. And, you know, you know, we grew up, we grew up hearing that women are supposed to live a particular way and they try to, um, they try to train us to want to be a lady. Mm -hmm. And I've never understood that concept, lady. I don't want to be a lady. Mm -hmm. I want to be me, whatever that is, in every second of every day. And it means sometimes I might want to fold my pleats neatly and sit down, but some other times I just want to want some jeans or some shorts. I don't want to climb a tree. I don't want to do all, all these things. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a lady. I don't want to sit side saddle. I want to straddle and gallop. <laughs> I wasn't born to be to fit in any box. So big heavy girl was just as I, I spent a lot of time trying to assert myself because people tended to judge me by my appearance, which was tiny and frail. Um and I was kind of a nerd, a little bit of a nerd too. So that didn't help. And I, I was socially awkward. I and I, I wasn't very friendly. I'm not very much more friendly now. <laughs> so people tended to interpret, people misinterpreted all of these things when they put them together. And I think people felt like I was, they, they felt like I, I was um, less than the giant that I am. Let's just put it that way. And, and I had to, I had to, see, I, Say that a, a, a million times, my big, my bad, and then I, I that's how I ended up starting to call myself a gangster girl, because I'm not gonna go out and 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 pick up weapons and fight you. I fight intellectual, I fight with my wits, I fight in more lasting ways because I understand that somebody can maim you right now, and you find a way to live with that. Unless they kill you, you're gonna find a way to live with that. But if I maim you, you're you're going to suffer permanently. <laughs> because you're very be diabolical. I am. Um and I feel that like everybody should be. I'm not a bad person. I would never attack anyone. But if you try to diminish me in any capacity, then I feel like I have to I have to put you out of commission so you don't do this to me or anybody else again. So I have to find a way that is going to permanently disable you from that activity. So whether it be you're a misogynist, um, you know, I have no tolerance for that. I have no tolerance for misogynists or people who um, engage in gender-based violence, uh, sexual violence. Um, I have no use for people who, who establish and maintain systems of oppression um, I feel like it is my obligation to the universe to dismantle those systems and fight to keep them out of commission. And so if you are, um, if, if you are somebody who works as an agent for any of those kind of systems, then we're at war. Just understand we are constantly, consistently, permanently at war and you're going to lose. I hear you comes from the lady that's a maverick when it comes to words. Your words, you don't mince nor play with words. You're you're a word magician. You're a word maverick. You your word smith. That's your thing. Well, I hope so, because words are my weapon of choice. Words are my tools of trade. And if I haven't mastered them, then I'm neither fighting nor am I working. So I better master them. <laughs> got you 
Another name you had brought up earlier too, Bobby Digital. How do you connect and how was it working with somebody as big as a Bobby Digital? Because Dave Kelly is a different beast altogether, but so is Bobby Digital. How was it dealing with him now? Bobby, well, I think it was the same Delroy Collins that introduced me to Bobby. Um, working with Bobby was... For me, it, it, was a, it was a really good thing for my development because Bobby Digital was uncompromising. And that is something that I really connected with because so am I. And he would have to go back a million times to fix one word. Um, and back then it wasn't like, no, when everything is lazy and you have Pro Tools and you have um, Logic Pro and these things. But then we had 24 track tape. You know, nobody has a time for that kind of tediousness to be taking takes, takes. So you, you get good. You know, you have no choice but to get good. And Bobby was, it was like training ground working with him, you know? Um, I think because he wasn't extremely social, it escapes, it, it, it escapes a lot of people who aren't deep into the music, um, how much of a genius he was. But working with him put me on a different level because he, he conquered a whole different landscape. You know, you know, Dave and Tony were like new school, Bobby of foundation. So Bobby was the, he, he's the, the, um, the promised land rhythm kind of badness, you know, and, and the fat, heavy bass, the, 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 the belly button music. And I, I, I think I actually thrived um, coming out of his hands. So I, I added dimension. Um, Barry O'Hare was emerging of everything. Bobby was a focus, a concentrated um, focus on particular, um, a particular path. And being there actually improved me. It was kind of like putting the sandpaper on the wood, you know, like, no, you, you, you calmed it already, but now you need it refined. No, we need the skin to be smooth. And I got smooth. Over at Bobby, that's big there. I'm going to take you back since, since we're talking full circle, I'm going to give you a full circle moment that I just realized. Exterminator, you started working with them very early. This is probably like 94, 95. And almost 10 years later, you went back and gave them a massive song with What A Day. What was that feeling like saying, okay, we started out here and it didn't really work, but then you came back with this monster now. And it's acoustic. What was that feeling like now going back and dealing with um, Fatis at Exterminator now with this massive song? So here's the thing. It wasn't really a went back. Because I never left. So Fatis, Fatis was one of kind of like one of my protectors in music. Um, he was like a therapist. If I had a, even when I was a recording for Exterminator, if I had a bad day, if I had, you know, he was like Barry on steroids. <laughs> because if anything happened, he was he was ready. Um, we'd take long drives. Drive from Kingston, we head to Negril. And for the entire drive, we just talk. We drive from Kingston, drive around to St. Elizabeth, drive and circle all the way back and come around St. Mary, come back to Kingston and just talk. Mm. Talk about everything. Like just open, just open up and talk. And I feel, I feel like we represented that for each other too because he would talk to me like in... Somehow, like he didn't talk to other people. I said, I'm, I'm not a judgmental person. So, and he, he didn't judge me either. So when we sat down to talk, we just opened up and we just let it out. And so it wasn't like I left Exterminator and came back. I wasn't recording. I was off doing other stuff, but we were, we, we were never, like the link never broke. Mm -hmm. um, and, and after... After coming back and doing What A Day, I think when, when I came back and did What A Day, the first song that I actually did in that phase of recording 
was a, a, a duet with Sizzler. Yes. Don't you take my love for granted. Mm -hmm. um, and that was just me hanging out at the studio because I used to have out with Sizzler and Fatty a lot. Um, even when I when I took a time off from my own career and I just I just wanted to clear my head. I just wanted to think and breathe and just be a normal person and not, you know, be on the road all the time. And I took time off, but then I went on the road with Sizzler. So I was on his US tour, the real thing. But it was different because no, it was work for me. It was just fun. I was hanging out. I was singing. And I was in the audience just singing along. And so when we, we were in Jamaica, and this is, let me see now. I, I went to the studio. I was just hanging out because Fatis was working. And Sizzler was recording. And he was making that song, Don't You Take My Love For Granted. And then he said, um, this is your part now, Tanya. I know, like, I have a part. <laughs> and I went in and I said something. And I think I said, I said something. And I was like, no, no, you can't say that. You can't. <laughs> and he, she flipped it around. I was like, whatever, whatever, Jared. I don't talk about that. And we changed it. And I changed it. And we laughed. And the song turned out really beautifully. And it was played a lot. And people loved it. And what a day came after that. And take him back. Let me see. Yeah. Take him back was Fatis. Um, mm -hmm. quite a few songs. Because it, it was a very it was a very productive phase I was going through. Like I was just writing, I was writing, I was writing. I couldn't stop. I would get up in the middle of the night and I wrote I converted a bedroom into a studio and I was just recording all the time, just making songs, making songs. I was taking rhythms from everybody. I was at the studio. I saw Flabba come in, he had the rhythm rolling. And, and back then everybody knew it for dance like hardcore dancer. And I saw a flap and I was like, what are you doing? And he said, he was recording. He, he had a rhythm, but he said, he said, boy, I'm going to ask if you go on it, but I know your type of rhythm. And that now was a challenge. I was like, what do you mean? It's not my type of rhythm. <laughs> He's like, no, I'm a dancer, I'm a dancer. I'm like, what are you trying to say, Flava? I can only go on that style. Don't be rude. And I said, play the rhythm. Let me hear it. <laughs> And that's what I did. What's your story on? So it was a very yes. productive time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a very productive time. And I was at Exterminator. I've, I've always been here, but that time I was recording like hell. And good stuff came out of it. Because I know this time you're doing a lot of work. So was this when you left for Switzerland? This was before or after all of this year? That was when I just came back from I was Sweden. I, I moved to Sweden. Well, I was visiting since 98 or 99. And then I moved there in 2000. I lived, on, I, I lived there um, for a year. I was, prior to that, I was just visiting. I would be there for months and then um, I had an apartment. And then I got a house and I lived there with my daughter, my niece. And mm -hmm. that relationship i was signed to warner sweet mm -hmm. and that relationship when it went I, not for all the not not for the regular reasons that relationships go bad in music but mine is different i, I have a very specific person that i am and i have a very specific way that i do things and i usually disclose in both my personal and professional life i am a full disclosure kind of person i tell you this is who i am this is how i do can you handle this and if you say yes, I expect you to handle this. And then when you don't handle this, I want to leave. I'm not sticking around to prove anything. So our, our relationship went south. I came back home to Jamaica. had to fight to come back to because they were trying to hold me to the contract. And I came, when I came back, I was kind of heartbroken. I didn't want to do music anymore. And it was actually Gerald Bell Davis, mm. G, formerly of Main Street, who told me that Lenky, Lenky had a beat. He told me that Lenky had a rhythm, and this was the Wally. So he said, um, Lenky, have a little rhythm, and come put something on it now. And I'm like, boy, G, I don't want to do no more music. I'm not doing music. I was looking for a place to set up a gym. I brought my trainer back with me from Stockholm, and we were going to open a gym. I didn't want to do music anymore. I was like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Too much heartbreak, I can't. And G was like, Boy, Lenky, you want to get him rhythm or, or just give him a strength. 
you know, come upon it. Because at the time, all these hit songs were not on it yet. He was trying to record and people were telling him no. And <laughs> so I said, all right, let me listen to it. Let me listen to it. And I listened to the beat. And I was like, well, it's kind of repetitive. Yeah, it's repetitive as hell. But it's nice. Um, let me see. And I, that's when I did um, Touch Me No More um, on it. And it started getting a lot of plays. And it was, was spinning like crazy in Jamaica. It, uh, of course, you know what happened with Duali. That was a monster. And then everybody started linking up and saying, I didn't know you were here. Are you back? Are you recording? Are you recording? And that's how I ended up back. So G's the one responsible for everything that happened after that. He's the one who was responsible because he's he was the one who got me to go into the studio. And then came the fatty stuff for the exterminator. Then came all the other things. And then while I was on tour in Europe, I recorded for Jamaican records with Lani, Pioneer. And that's where It's a Pity came from. So I was back. There was no escaping it. I was back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, since you brought up that, I was going to ask you about It's a Pity. Because again, how you constructed that song now, how did you even go into your mind and come up with something like that now? Because this isn't something that we've really heard you speak about before. This is probably the blueprint for something you would speak about for later on. How did you come up with that? Well, I didn't go into my mind to come up with it. I went into my history. <laughs> oh, my God. It's life. It's just life. <laughs> um, we take life we take seriously. You know, it, it's, it's a pity. It's a song about, um, about unrequited. What is it? It is unexpressed love or lost. Let me use lost. <laughs> um, it's a longing for um, you know, and in the song, I'm saying, you know, if only we could, mm. of course, you know, in real life, I don't have those limits, <laughs> but in the song, poetic license, um, enacted, I, I use, I exercise discretion in the song and said, oh, I'm so sorry. We can't do this. Mm. And it turns out everybody thinks like that. You, it was, a it, it, it was so popular, you know? And I just want to say big up Trinidad because it's a pity actually broke first in Trinidad. You know, Trinidad was a place that not Jamaica, Trinidad. Big up Trinidad. Was that music video playing on BET also? Was it that one there? Yeah. It crossed so many, but it's like every time, every time I level up, it feels like, all right, I don't want to go anywhere else. I'm, I'm good right here. And then we level up again and it was like, Oh, all right. This is cool. Like I'll stay right here. And then we'll, <laughs> it's a pity. It was like the ultimate level up, you know? And then I really was comfortable and didn't want to go anywhere else. Um, you know, it, it crossed so many boundaries, so many borders, you know, I, it got me into places where I had previously hadn't been, um, I, I, I entered a track where sometimes I'm on the road and I see nobody uh, familiar to me. And the good thing is that music makes all of us familiar, though. We become familiar really easy. So, so it was always comfortable, but it's a pity did things. You know, it did some things, um, some really good things. And then these streets came and it was like the button was passed and it just kept going. Um, but... You know, I understand that people, the people loving these songs is what makes them the giants that they are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not my making them, it's people actually loving them that makes them the giant. And I'm grateful for that. I'm really grateful because I've heard some amazing songs which didn't see the light of day. I've heard some really, really good music that got put out and for one reason or another, people didn't hear it. People, it wasn't the right time for that. Something else was happening. You know, there's so many variables that I can't help but be grateful and understand that my music gets into the space. Cause when you get something like, it's a pity. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, it's gravity. It's humbling. You know, these streets, 
humbling. What are they? Humbling. You know, ready for this yet? Humbling. Because I have heard so much good music being put out from so many good artists that I know that I am one of many doing part of much. So I'm grateful that these songs did these things, you know, but it was amazing. It still continues to be. I'm, I'm always... I'm always surprised. I go someplace, the middle of nowhere. People sing word for word and then they cry. When they cry, I cry. Because this is just such a bundle of raw emotions. You know, it's like raw nerves. And I get why people cry. Mm -hmm. Because I cry. I cry watching cartoons and sappy romance movies. I get it. It's the emotion that it evokes in you. You know? Um, okay, even with these streets, if a lot of people don't know, that was your production. This is when you threw your hat in the ring. So, you know what? I'm going to actually write and produce something like that. And with the video too, a lot of scenes, they had the scenes from Shatas in that video. Yeah. Well, for these streets, the production, first of all, the guy who played that beat was my Swedish producer. Emil Gotthard, and he, he's not a reggae producer at all. He's used to doing pop. Mm -hmm. So that's why it came out sounding like that. And it's a, an amazing beat. And why I keep telling people music has no boundaries and we should stop trying to introduce them. Um, you know, we, we, we click, we work together. So after the relationship with Warner went so, and I came back to Jamaica, when I started doing music again, I invited Emil to come to Jamaica. And he came and we made um, some music and these streets was one of them. And when we, we released that, I wasn't prepared for that either. Because what? it went to some places where I just, I, you know, let me tell you, I'm a child. My, I'm getting, my, my body's getting old, but I am a child. Growing old is mandatory. Growing up is optional. I don't remember who first said it, but I have, I have plagiarized it so much that it starts feeling like mine now. <laughs> but I have no intention of ever being anything but a child. I'm going to be a child for the rest of my life. And so every time I come across my music doing something like, like what these streets did, I hold my head. I pinch myself. I can't stop giggling. Like, yeah, I'm from Richmond. What are the odds? I come from Richmond, St. Near. What are the odds that somebody over in wherever is singing this song word for word, you know, and saying they can relate and, and loving it and loving me, that is overwhelming, you know? And I don't want to, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to ever wake up one day I feel like this is normal because it's not. It is not normal. And this is how I preserve my sanity in a, in a crazy space like this. But just having, having these songs come out and, and you know, I, I pr started producing my own stuff because it, it, there were too many limits being put on artists who were going to the studio. I'm having people telling me, no, you're trying to make the song too pretty. No, you're trying to do too much of that. No, you're trying to do, you know what? When I, Enter my space. Most of the time when I'm recording, I'm the only person there. I record my own vocals. You know, for Gangsta Blues, most of Gangsta Blues and all of Revolution, I record my vocals and everything after that. Even when you hear me record and I drop leaf, I record my vocals and I zip the files and send them off. Because if I walk into the studio, I am being guided by somebody who puts limits on music, but I don't put any limit. So this is why when I sing a cherry brandy, I have abstract uh, harmony, because I have so many verses. They can't fit. It would be a 20-minute song, so I just double the verses. I put my verse under a verse, and I sing it as abstract harmony and, mm -hmm. and turn it down below the, the vocals. So you end up getting something that's that has so much more dimension. You know? It's bigger. It's fatter. It's... Yeah. I, I love producing myself. I don't take all the credit for my productions because it's not about credit for me. It's about the end product. So sometimes the men like to like to be known as a producer. And I'm like, okay, it's fine. I don't care. 
as long as you allow me to do my song the way I hear my song in my head. Because when I'm writing, I hear the entire song. I'm hearing background. I'm hearing abstract. I'm hearing sound effects. And I'm also seeing the song playing out. I am seeing every single thing. So I, when I write, I could write music video treatment the same time I write a song because I'm seeing everything as I'm hearing it in my head. And, and so, it, you know, as long as I get my song to come out the way I'm hearing it in my head, I am fine. And this is why you're not, you, you don't really see Tanya Stevens listed as producer on most of my stuff because I, I share credit, you know? Even if I'm, now I'm doing a lot of collabs on this new album and I share credit for everything that I write. Somebody else performs it. The reason why I reach out to that person is because I know they're going to deliver something that completes the song the way I hear it in my head. And so I believe that deserves credit. So I give them credit. But at the end of the day, I know what I want to hear. And so I produce. I micromanage myself. Sometimes it, it, it's a pain in the neck. Sometimes I don't like me. But <laughs> at the end of the day, I am happy with my results. Because now I'm listening to this. I don't finish the album. And I know at some point, because I'm doing the album with Tads, right? And I know that sometimes Judah Tads, when I get miserable, he might be looking at me like, girl, God. But when we're finished and he hears this, yo, know, it's a different thing. You know, you know, I'm, I'm really miserable about getting, getting the standard, the quality that I want. I know what I want to hear. I don't care what's going on out there. I don't care if right now, snaps are in. I don't want a snap. What I want is a clap. Oh, but then the claps are over. I don't care. I am making a song that needs a clap, not a snap. And no matter how close they sound, it's not the same thing. And I want exactly what I want. So this is why I produce my stuff. Because I get what I want. I push myself. And the next thing, people don't want to push you. You know, when you're established in music, people tiptoe around you. I don't want that. I don't want that. How am I going to make a good product if you don't correct me? If you're afraid to tell me that I was off key, I was cracking, I'm wrong. If I have bad grammar, I need somebody to put their foot down. And I realize that I'm the only one who does that with me. So I am my worst critic. I'm rough. And sometimes when I work out in myself, you'd think there are six people inside here because I'm cursing myself like you get a one word. You can't get one effing word, right? <laughs> Just get you wrote the song. How can you not remember the words? <laughs> I'm, like, I'm hard on myself too. I'm like, you need to ease up off the whiskey. Yo, put down the glass. <laughs> <laughs> the cherry brandy. But at the end of the day, yeah, we get we get what we go for. And that's why I produce myself. And so it's not because I I think I'm the best. It's not because I'm a diva. It's none of those things. It's about the end product. I want the best product. That makes that makes total sense, sir. You brought up a name too, which is again, this is another pivotal moment for you. Recording with Don Corleone on the drop leaf after you listen. I listened to that song again. Yes, I come preparing for the interview and stuff. To me, the craziest verse in that song is the third verse. When you go into the verse and then you go into the rant at the end, I said, listen, this lady's on another level, boss. How did you come up with that? <laughs> well, it's life. Life is the best inspiration you can possibly find. Um, just looking at people's lives, I write about experiences. So they're either my experiences or they're the experiences of other people around me. And there's no shortage of that, you know? So I, I, I it's life. I've seen that play out a million times when for, for the drop leaf story, how many times have you seen a woman enter a relationship when she's young and viable and has shelf life. And there's a man who's prizing her because right now she's hot. And then he, he they have four kids together. And then he decides, you know what? I want to upgrade. And they call it an upgrade. They even say it in those words, upgrade. How do you upgrade a human? That is disgusting. And then they leave this woman who, there's nothing wrong with her. But we do know that after having four kids for this man, another man is going to think twice before even 
getting to know her to see if they could be soulmates or anything because she comes with baggage and it's that other guy's baggage and he leaves to go off and find somebody else to, to spend the rest of his life with while she sits and tries to figure. And the men have some bad habits too because they'll tell you, oh, you don't need to work. I don't want you to work. So you, you're a stay-at-home mom and you're, just, you're making his home. And then he leaves you. You haven't worked in 15 years. You know what midlife, what are you supposed to do? And they don't care. And that was the frame of mind I was in when I was writing that song, you know, just putting myself in that woman's position and thinking, how, it's easy to say, move on, but it's not easy to do. No, she has no work experience. She hasn't touched a, a, an office, sorry, a, a job space in, 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 in over a decade. Everything has changed. She used to write Shatan. Shatan is extinct. You know, what is she going to do? How is she going to fend for herself? You know, and he doesn't feel obligated to do anything, even though she's the one who helped him to, to amass whatever worth he has. He doesn't feel like he owes her anything at all. This is the ingratitude of humans that I don't like this species, you know, that he will say, well, it's my money. I was the one who worked. No, you both worked. She made you a life. You couldn't go to work comfortable and happy and balanced and do all of that. If she wasn't the one making sure when you come home, you brought over your friends from work and impressed them. And it made you move up in the company because she made a home. Do you listen? Don't get me started. I get emotional. I rant because yes, it's wrong. It's a travesty. It's, it should be illegal. It should be punishable by law. You know, you leave some, you, I think we, we, we have life all wrong. You know, when we get together, we celebrate that. And we, when we pitch in and we help each other, when people are getting together, they move in, they get married, they get presents. These are two people doing something together. They're more likely able to do it together. But when they part and this woman goes off with absolutely nothing, she gets nothing. The more successful person coming out of the marriage takes the friends. Nobody wants to associate with a loser. So you don't even have friends now. Everybody goes off with this man because he's successful and he's hot. And you are one with four kids and nothing. And maybe you get some alimony, maybe. And God bless what that can do. <laughs> was that the only song that you actually recorded with Don or you guys did more and they didn't come out? Um, I think that was the only one. Was it? Yeah, that was the only one. Any yeah. reason in particular? No. I tell you, I'm an all over the place kind of person. I will work with anybody mm -hmm. um, as long as they're creative and they make good stuff. I don't think I was ever on any more. I can't remember being on any other non beat, but we worked together after that though, because he helped Liquid and uh, DJ Wayne when they were doing their productions and I recorded for them. Mm -hmm. So I did record at his studio um, on another occasion. I think on, what was that beat again? Cause if I style you want you know me run that. And if I do have come make me born that. I can't remember the name of the beat, but I did record with Don again. And, and, and we, we don't have any beef. Or anything. It's, it's, no, it's never beef. Mm -mm. I don't allow beef to get between me and music. Music is sacred for me. No beef can touch that. Beef can only touch personalities and personal um, behavior and stuff like that. But professionally, I'm not letting any petty squabble or just stop me doing whatever I wanted to do with business. So mm -hmm. it's not me. We just, but you see, I don't like to force music to happen. So if we make music, we make music. And if we don't make music, we don't make music. It, it, it has no deeper meaning than that. For me, every song should feel it. My, my process is very organic. Every song should feel natural. Like it grew there. You know, not like we tried to put it there, but it sprung up out of the ground and it grew there. It belonged there. It should feel like it fit. And if it doesn't feel that way, I don't want to do it. I don't care what anybody else thinks. You know, other people's thoughts are theirs. It's none of my business. Um, I work off my own feelings and it has to be, it, it, the, the music has to come out of compatibility 
And I don't, I, I think compatibility is not static because people are always growing. So we, if we were compatible last year, we are not necessarily compatible next year. You know, so we, if we work together five years ago, it doesn't automatically mean we can work together now. Because where you are now might conflict with where I am now. And, and when we come back around, because we keep moving, so we pass each other again. And when we intersect again, we make music again and keep it moving. Just the same. It's not, it, I, I don't take it personally. You know, I don't take it personally that we can meet a relationship together. I don't take it personally that we can can't make music together. I don't take it personally that we can't do anything or any particular thing together. Because when it works, it works. And when it doesn't, we shouldn't force it. That's the beauty of creating music together. This is another one where you, you again, use your pen, but you use your pen for more of a conscious vibe right here. And you produce a song here too, The Other Cheek. How do you come up with that journal? Well, The Other Cheek was easy. Because it, it, it was a reflection of what I was thinking and what people on the ground, the masses in Jamaica, um, was thinking. Mm -hmm. It was the echo of the economic strain, um, you know, unemployment high, um, underemployment high. People just weren't being, people weren't, operating at ma maximum capacity or even anywhere close to. And compens uh, uh, under compensation um, was the order of the day. I mean, still, still right now. Uh, we haven't improved. Um, crime, high, and people focus on all the wrong things. Education is not a focus. Health is not a focus. It's everything else that cannot bring us to the place we claim we want to go. That's always the focus. And so it, it felt, it just felt like that was what I needed to say. That, you know, listen to us. And, and I understand, I don't know if I understand, but I know. I know that politicians tend to be egomaniacs, that they tend to be very personal. And when you criticize their performance, they act like you're criticizing their torso. And... <laughs> as if you have no entitlement in the criticism. Um, and, and when they make promises to do jobs, they don't feel any obligation to actually deliver on a promise. And when you demand accountability, you're the bad guy. But it just felt like I needed to appeal. It, at the time it was PJ Patterson who was Prime Minister of Jamaica and I wanted to say, listen man, I know all on the ego fragile. You probably think me are this year, but I'm not this year. Me are only accountable. There's a difference, it's not on this. It's an entitlement that I have and that every citizen of the country has. Every citizen of every country has that entitlement. I mean, over time, we've seen that our rights have been eroded. Our rights are slowly being taken away from us. And, and sometimes not even slowly, as in the case of you guys. Like, you were jacked. But the reality is, <laughs> the reality is that we have all these rights and they have been so eroded over time that sometimes even we don't realize that we're giving up our rights. You know, and we defend the people who are stealing them. I never forget who I am and my entitlements. I never forget. I have the right to be free. I have the right to self-expression. I have the right to earn, to feed myself and family. I have the right to basic human dignity. I have these inalienable rights. And so I will fight to the death to defend them. And all I'm saying in the songs is, hey, remember these rights? Can we have a little respect for them? Can you allow us to live? We just want to live without asking for much. I'm not saying that everybody should become um, wealthy, but why does the bottom have to be so low? Why can't we raise the bottom? When you have one human, one human in possession of, over $200 billion. And there are only 7 point odd billion people on the planet. If he gave everybody a billion dollars, he would still be a 200 and odd billionaire. Mm -hmm. This is the height of hoarding and selfishness. And to ask people to bite the bullet, to ask people to tighten their belts, it's just rude. It's rude when you're asking people 
So you're forcing healthcare on them, but you're not forcing food. You're not forcing education. Children cannot afford education. And you're comfortable having them go without education for life, having a, an illiterate class. But you're trying to force them to take an injection to prevent a flu. These things like these piss me off. I know, okay, since we're down this path here, I know that you were, um, you had some legal issues with Little Kim over some music. What had happened in that situation there? And it was, we really didn't have legal issues. It was a plagiarism case and it was settled out of court. And it was a simple thing. It was a song. It wasn't just my song. It was a few people's song. Um, and publishing, my, my publisher um, reached out to them. And at first, her, her representative was very rude. And I, I found that shocking because we know each other, you know? Mm -hmm. And that, well, they settled that. It wasn't something that me and Kim, we didn't get to get on and box it out. It was a bunch of professional liar, lawyers deal, dealt with it. And it got fixed. So it wasn't a big deal. There's no bad blood. There's no feelings. Well, at least I don't have any. Um, we haven't seen each other since then. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing, there's no residue. There's nothing with me. I'm fine. I, and that was just some of my work that got taken and it was very obvious. It was very, very obvious. It wasn't something, um, it wasn't a reach. You know, there were parts from me, piece of a Shabba song. I think there were a few people were encroached upon and it got fixed. And it's sad that she did that because we were in touch with each other before if she had reached out to me. I would have written her something way better than that. And I wouldn't even need the credit. But to just go and take something that's already registered and call it your own, credit yourself, like that, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Well, it's good that you guys worked it out and everything worked out in the end. Another thing, I know you did some background vocals on a Garnet Silk song. Um, every knee shall bow. How did that was this was this before he died or this was after he died? Um, this is while he was alive. Um, Delroy Collins, the same guy I told you, he introduced me to Dave Kelly and introduced me to um, Bobby Digital. Uh, he was working with Garnet and he got me, man, that was fun. I, I love Garnet. You know, I really, really love Garnet. He was such a sweet person, like sweet. And, uh, and very few humans, you come into their presence and they live up to your expectations, if if you manage to get exposed to them prior to meeting them. Um, but very few few humans you come around and you only experience warmth and friendliness and love and tenderness, you know? And Garnet was one such person. He was really, really, really sweet. And I, I was around him a lot because he was at Bobby Digital too. Um, he was at Roof in Ochi. He was by Grove Music a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were in the same spaces many times and there was never ever, and I don't know anybody that has a different experience. I've never met one person. You know, you can meet people who will tell you, oh, Tanya Stevens, she's a jackass. You can meet those people. I've never met one person who said anything like that about Garnet. Never. Do you have one story in particular with garnet silk that stands out that you'll never forget? No, <laughs> I don't. I mean, he's not that kind of person. I mean, he's in the studio. He jokes a lot. He joked a lot. Um, mm -hmm. He would muster, but he was rude. So he didn't. He didn't bully. He didn't, you know, target anyone in particular. He joke. He was. He was into laughter. Um, he was nice. So. And, and to describe him like that, it feels bad to me. I feel like I'm doing something wrong because it makes it seem as if he was boring. He wasn't. But he didn't, he wasn't a standout kind of guy, really. He's a great singer, great performer. I mean, if I tell you that things that stood out was me being able to be in the studio when he was recording and just feeling like I was special and blessed. But that doesn't translate well. You have to be there, you know. It's, it's everything about him stood out, but nothing jumped out from everything else. Got you. Very good there. 
Did you ever do some work on an Isley Brothers album? Oh, yeah, there was a remix. Let me see. That was Lenky. I think it was Lenky who did that remix. Um, in Between the Sheets, it was. I think it was In Between the Sheets. Um, and I, I haven't really heard that song again. I would love to hear it. It was such fun making it. <laughs> and it felt, it felt nice to be cheeky on an Isley Brothers song because I grew up listening to them and they're icons and it, it felt like I was being a little bit blasphemous and it, and that felt nice. Like, yeah, I'm going to do something. Yeah. Such a rebel. Yeah. Such a rebel. <laughs> such a rebel. <laughs> and I'm such a perv, so I was a perv on it. <laughs> You're so funny. Yeah, I don't so funny. <laughs> It's do you do you find that you get to live more through your music than in your real life, or you and your music are basically the same? Well, the I'm not I'm not two people. The person I am in real life is the person that I am on the record. But yes, I do get to do way more through my music because remember, my music can get to places where my music can be everywhere at once. I can only be in one place at a time. So the music has no boundaries, no limits, whereas I have physically have limits, you know. Um, and the, through the music, like we're talking right now, mm -hmm. this, the music made this happen, you know. Me and you meeting, talking. Um, Tanya Stevens or Vivian Stevenson, the person, wouldn't have any, any access to you. You wouldn't have any access to her, but you wouldn't even know she existed. You know, um, so the mu yes, by far the music does does make me live a lot bigger. And, and when I say bigger, I don't mean in terms of material stuff. I mean, I live a very large life musically. Yeah, I get to do things and be places and touch people. I get to touch people. You know how important and special that is, being able to touch people. And it makes me... It makes me feel very responsible. I want to touch them in a very nice way. I want to touch them lovingly. I want to be useful and in a good way, you know? So, yeah, the music does that. Music affords me so many privileges and luxuries that I would never be able to access without it. Definitely. Talking about music, I know you're working on a new album and you actually have out a new song right now, Diamonds in the Sun, all right? How do you come up with that? And how does it feel to actually be working on a new album? Because I think it's been, wow. How long has it been since you put out your last album? And why do you think right now is a time to put out the music? Well, my last major release was in 2006. <laughs> that was Revolution. Since then, I did a free album. I gave out, I, you know, people were going through stuff and it felt right. Like, you know what? When you're going through things, there's a recession. When you're going through things and People are broke. They're rebuilding their lives. Um, and I felt like I still wanted to be there. I'm not going to sell you a product because right now we have more important things to buy. But I still want to be a part of the soundtrack of the rebuilding of your life. I want to be there. I want to be in your house. I want to be in your car. I want to be in your ear. I want to be there. You know, I want to be on Titania. And so it felt like a good way to do that. You know, it, I, I don't only want to be around when there are good times and people can spend money on me. I want to be there through it all, you know? Um, and the way to do that, it, a lot of people were so angry when I did it. I had people cursing me out. What am I doing to the music business and giving an album? And I'm, I'm, one man told me I was mashing up music. I guess he was a music distributor and he couldn't sell my album. And I, I don't know, the relationship between me and my audience is personal and intimate. And I don't allow other people to get in between us so it didn't matter but i did that album it wasn't a major release and it was available temporarily and then i did after that um that, that, that free album was in Falbo, i think and then guilty was the other one um but not neither of those were major releases i wasn't um affiliated to any label really and i there was no promotion done on it nothing i just you know i just threw them out but this teaming up with tads is the first major release since Revolution in 2006. Um, and I feel like it's time. 
we've been we've been flirting with working with each other for a long time and we're both happy that we didn't do it then because right now where we are psychologically where we are musically is where we want to be together so this is the right time and what we're making why we can't wait for sure to do know because boy oh badness badness when you talk about I, I i'm not really big on collaborations but this album has quite a few and i think it's because number one i turn 50 next year i don't know how many more albums i'm going to make um number two because i was so caught up in trying to establish myself and assert myself I never left room on my albums for anybody else. And there are people I want to work with. And so I never did that before. And this album, on this album, I'm doing that. Um, I, I'm making up for everything. You know, it's like I say things that I never said. I'm doing things. I'm working with people. When you talk about a collaboration with Big Youth, kind of things on Big Youth, Mazzotti, nah, <laughs> get out of here. You know what I mean, man. <laughs> badness. Stupid <laughs> badness. And I'm, the little kid in me is so happy. I feel so accomplished because if my 10-year-old self, if my 5-year-old self could see me now, oh, God, she would she would probably faint because this girl be me. This could never be my life, you know? I'm doing stuff. Um, and it feels right. So when I was a kid, I got to watch Nadine Sutherland on TV and it made me feel represented. It felt nice. And when I'm an adult, grown woman, hitting midlife, I'm, I, I'm doing recording music with daddy. And we're friends. And we're sisters. And it's nice. You know? So this album, I feel like it's the right time. I feel like it's the right time. I am where I'm supposed to be mentally, psychologically, emotionally. I am where I'm supposed to be. I'm comforting. You know, this is not back when... I was pushing, I, you know, when you come from poverty, you work hard because you never ever, you want to ensure it's like you're stacking nuts and you're just For stacking sure. nuts and stacking, nuts. you don't stop to breathe and you don't rest because, you know, winter might come and you don't want that to catch you. So you're just nuts. And then one day you wake up and you realize, hey, you can chill, you have a lot of nuts. <laughs> and now I could just relax and enjoy the environment, just enjoy the scenery and enjoy the company of the other squirrels. And that's what I'm doing on this record. It's I'm talking about issues that but I mean just the same as you can tell on diamonds in the sun. Now picture this. Hmm. A record with Tanya Stevens featuring Sidney Lamali and Diana King. In fact, King, formerly Diana King. Now these are powerhouses on their own. Put them together. And, and all three of us, I think, are misrepresented people, misinterpreted, misrepresented people. Um, and we have some of the same causes. We do the same work, you know. We're all activists. We're working towards the same thing, but just in different ways and attacking from different angles. So Sidella works, a lot, a lot of people don't know what she does, but she does a lot of activism and she does so much work for women. Okay. She's working all the time. She doesn't talk about it. So it, it doesn't come up and nobody sees her as like one of us because a mom Molly picked me, you know, and it's so unfair. She doesn't get to be the individual, but we see her work. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw her doing some work was when she took on the reggae girls. And I was like, oh, well, she crazy. What are you doing? And then after when I saw what she did with them and when she brought them to her, I was like, whoa, let me look at this girl again. Mm -hmm. Because I could have been wrong. Let me look at this girl again. She look crazy. <laughs> she sees things. And she saw what many people, including myself, didn't see. Before anybody looked at those girls, she saw them. And she's been doing so much work with females in general. Trying to level the playing field for us. You know? And this is the kind of work that I do. I come from a different angle. Diana does. Comes from a different angle. You know? And so... Putting us on one record, Jesus, I, I'm overwhelmed and I like that. Is there any date where we were the album or right now you're just working and putting it together? 
Well, it is our intention because this year I turned 49. So it's apt that it should be released on my birthday because one of the tunes on the album, which will be released on my birthday, is talking about just that, that next year I turned 50. And it says, if you think my bad, no, wait till my late 50. <laughs> I'm going to be badder. <laughs> you see, because the trick with turning 50 in this, let's call it dance hall reggae space, is something that a lot of people don't speak about. But I see artists now, especially the artists that came up in the 90s, are really turning 50 now. So this is a, a big topic that a lot of people don't discuss, but a lot of you guys are going through it right now as we speak. Oh, listen to me, baby. I love this. I know that it's not typical for women to embrace aging, but it's so much fun. I love it. And when I was young and I spoke my mind, uh, people thought I was talking about of turn and try to silence me much more. Now I'm older and I speak my mind. They don't like it, but they don't get to tell me to shut up. You know, I'm a big woman. I could do this. I'm outspoken. And, and back then I didn't have any cover. No, I have cover. Hey, listen to me. I'm grown. I could say whatever I want. I can do what I want. I don't care about you. You and your feelings could find the highest cliff and dive. And that's what aging does for you. It gives you that kind of, you, you get that kind of license, to be honest, and to be transparent and to be open, forthcoming. We beat round no bushes. <laughs> At that point in your life, there is no need. This is the last, I purposely left this question for the last question because this is very sensitive, and the only reason I'm going to even speak about this is because you brought it up in public already, all right? You going through the situation a sexual assault early in your career, was that something that, how come it didn't really just totally turn you off from music altogether where you say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this because it was so early in your career? Because you hear people might go through this, but this is something you went through. What made you actually continue to push forward well i understood that music didn't do that to me mm. music didn't do that um and this thing happens all over it happens in every industry in every social space it happens in homes i was aware and so i didn't blame i've never blamed music music didn't do anything music has only been therapy for me Music has been my therapy, my means of survival. It's only done good things for me. And if somebody bad entered the music space and did something bad, that's not a fault of music. You know, that's not music did that. People do bad things. And people are everywhere. So no, that wouldn't stop me from doing music. What? That actually fueled me. That made me want to do more. That made me want a voice. That made me want to be so big that... I overshadowed and outdid my perpetrator. I wanted to be so much bigger than him, you know? I wanted him to see me. I wanted to stand on the top of a mountain so tall that there was no space on earth you could get to where you wouldn't see me. Excel, strive, and be bigger and better and better than him. And I've done that. That is the best, best revenge you can possibly have. Trust me, work for me. Um, there are so many times when I could have, I could have been vengeful. There are so many people who wanted to go for it, who just wanted a name. That would not have made me happy. It wouldn't have. Maybe it would have made me grin for five minutes, but then that would have been that would have been on on my, my permanent record karmically. I don't want it. And then I would have married myself to this cold drill permanently. You know. As far as the universe is concerned, and on my record, I don't want it. I talk about this because it's relevant and because it's necessary to talk about it, to bring light to the subject and to try and get rid of this bad behavior. And that's the only reason why he comes up, you know? And this is why I don't call his name. I would never validate such a creep. He's extinct and I'm going to help him to stay that way. I'm not calling his name. He gets to remain anonymous as just another 
He's just just a lot of piece of garbage on the floor that I had to sweep up during the course of my life. And he gets thrown out on the pile of garbage, and he's just one of many on a pile of garbage. He doesn't get to be somebody. He doesn't get to be named so that the people who don't like me can can bring him back to life. He gets to stay dead. I'm never calling his name. He knows what he did. I know what he did. And all the people defending him, they know who he is. So we don't need to discuss that. You know, I, but I talk about it because, because it happens too many times in too many spaces. And it's not music that did it. If we, if we make it seem like music, if I would have said music did it, then I would have invalidated all the other experiences of all the other victims and survivors in every other space. So no, it's not music. Music has never done anything but good. But bad people exist everywhere, including in music. And they do bad things wherever they go. I couldn't ask for a better answer because that's probably one of the best answers that you could have actually given me towards something like that. Right now, the floor is yours. Anything you want to say, anybody you want to big up, give out some social handles, tell them when they, your album's coming or when they can look for it, tell them to buy it, all that good stuff now. Tanya Stevens, the floor is yours before I get you out of here. Okay. Thank you for giving me a floor. <laughs> well, listen, I let me just say that it really has been a great time. Making music is by far the best soul work I could ever possibly do. Music and I are a match. We fit. I And, and this is not about what I sound like to other people. This is about what it feels like to me. We fit, and I've enjoyed making music. And it even, it, it's been made even better by the fact that people like my music. I am happy for that. I would make music regardless, but people like it, and that makes it much more, um, you know, it, it feels so much more fulfilling to hear that people can relate. So I just first want to say thanks to everybody who has been listening to me throughout the years, people who have bought my records, who have um, come to my concerts, you know, and I, I especially appreciate the people who come to the concerts because that is therapy in action for me. Um, it's I, People have told me that it's like therapy for them, but trust me, it's therapy for me. So thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, and when I make music, I don't ask for support. I ask people to listen to it. And if you like it, get it. Because everything is not for everybody. So check it out. I, mean, I think I make some pretty good music. And if it's for you, then let us. Us, let us keep the conversation going because this is what it is for me. I engage in conversation in every forum, including in my music. And you're all welcome. If you're on social media, join me. Um, if you are fragile, do not come. <laughs> it's not for you. Uh, and by fragile, I mean if you have a problem with particular words, because we, we speak very openly. Um, if you have a problem with particular topics, uh, there are no limits there. We only ask that we be respectful to each other. I'll try my best. And if I am disrespectful, I take, I take correction. Um, and it's my space. So I ask everybody else to do the same. It is not about expletives because I don't, I'm not, I'm not hurt when people tell me expletives. It is about context more than content. Um, so I, 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 I invite you all to come join me. You don't have to follow. I'm not looking for followers. I'm not looking to up my numbers. I really, really want to be a part of conversation. And I want to be a facilitator of conversation. I want us to talk more. I want us to discuss the problems that we have so that we can solve them. I'm really into solution, you know? And in the process, we make some good music. Check it out if you like it, get it. The album is coming. Um, is Look out for the album this summer. And check out this, the single Diamonds in the Sun featuring Sidella Marley and King, formerly known as Diana King. Um, and big up Tad's records. Yo, Tad's, Junior Tad's, and Father Tad's. Big up on yourself. It's such a comfortable workspace. Um, big up my daughter, Kelly, who has come through for me um, in so many ways. You know, and big up the entire team where I work on the album. They can begin. If I start listening names, I'm going to lift out somebody to go feel a way. Big up every artist, every musician every engineer, everybody who I work on the album because I feel so good. I haven't felt like this since 2006. <laughs> yeah. So it feels nice. I thank you guys. And a big up every... Listen, you might hear me cursing out journalists sometimes. 
I'm going to continue to do that because some journalists are exacerbators of petty squabbles. You have some people who go for the shock value and the, they click bait. And so if they hear that two artists have an argument, they run in for the kill. They want to push that because arguments sell. I will always curse them out. I'm not, I am not into those kind of journalists. But for every other journalist who are doing the work, people who actually do the real work, people who do investigative journalism, people who get to the meat of the matter, people who ask questions which get, you know, real answers, people who want to showcase people, even if I did something wrong and you want to show that too, it's fine. You're a journalist. You're entitled to that right. But people who want to exacerbate problems, nah, nah, goodbye. You know, so big up on yourself. For everybody who played the music, for everybody who did the interviews, big up on yourself. Thank you. You know, this is group work. And can I just say thanks to everybody of every race, every color, every class, every creed. I know that right now it gets a little bit confusing when you hear some conversations. It doesn't represent all of us. <laughs> music is inclusive. Music is inclusive. We're not exclusive. And reggae is a unifying tool. It means that if you've heard reggae, you're inspired by reggae, you're creative and you express it, it's okay to express in reggae. It doesn't matter what color you are. It really doesn't matter where you're from because we are everywhere. So how can we not expect everywhere to respond to us? You know, welcome. There's always more room in music. Music is not a finite space. It's expansive and it's limitless. So welcome. I want to hear your music. I want to hear more music. We can never have enough music. We can't run out of music. So welcome. I'm big up on myself here. Bless up. Love and love. Where could they follow you on Instagram or Facebook or all those stuff there? On Instagram, I am I am Tanya Stevens. And it is verified. So the Tanya Stevens with the blue tick, that's me. The I am Tanya Stevens. And on Twitter, I am Tanya underscore Stevens. On Facebook, I, am, I think I'm just Tanya Stevens, but that's also verified. So the Tanya Stevens, that's verified on Facebook, that's me. And my conversations vary between Instagram and Facebook. Um, you know, right now I'm mostly on Instagram, but yeah, you don't have to join to join in. So you could just come and partake and you can share too. Please teach me something. I really love to learn. Mm -hmm. Teach me something I never, I didn't know before. You understand. Tanya Stevens, this conversation, I knew it was going to be a good one, you know, but this was great. Your <laughs> openness, your honesties, and your honest, and how you just express yourself, it was just amazing. You understand? That's Thank what you. all of us are, but some of us suppress. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. No problem. One last request. Can I please get a D Streets muscle acapella before we go. <laughs> These streets don't love you like I do. Muscle you need for no that. You want to keep your woman loving you. Ooh, ooh. You need for sure that. They love we have what it takes so much effort for bill. Nobody can blow that. It was like a plate on jersey. I am muscle. <laughs> Tanya, thank you so much. Your vibe, your energy, everything about you is so great. Let me give you an outro and get you out of here, all right? Big up. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is Muscle, and this has been another Two Live Music Huts Entertainment Report podcast, and we are out. Bye. This podcast is brought to you by www.twolinedmusichut.com.